Good afternoon, everyone. And, wow. Welcome to this session on Leadership 4.0, which I'm sure we're all looking forward to having be defined for us today. Um, my name is Sadia Zahidi. I head the Forum Center for the New Economy and Society, and I'm a managing director here at the Forum. Very excited to have you here. Welcome also on the first day of the annual meeting of new champions. Um, I'm going to start with a little bit of a question for the audience before introducing our, our speakers. So we know that we're in the midst of an era of unprecedented globalization, unprecedented technological change. We know that we're dealing with major crises such as um, climate change. We know we're dealing with major social inequalities around the world. How many of you feel you are well equipped in terms of your leadership skills to deal with the challenges to come in the next five years? If you feel well equipped in terms of your leadership skills, raise your hands. A few people shyly raising their hands. Hopefully, <laughs> when we walk out of here in half an hour, we'll know just a little bit more about how to manage the changes that are coming up, learning from the experiences thus far of two fantastic leaders who are joining us. Um, Alain Dejas is the Chief Executive Officer of the ADECA Group, based in Switzerland, and Minister Al-Falasi is the Minister of State for Higher Education and Advanced Skills of the United Arab Emirates. Welcome to both of you. Um, this will be a slightly different session than usual at the forum, so I'm going to pose them their first two questions, but after that, they're going to be asking each other questions and carrying on the conversation spontaneously. So, the first question um, is for Minister Falasi, which is on, can you describe a formative experience in your past that has helped prepare you to become a leader in this new era of globalization? Mm -hmm. And for you, Alain, what is one concrete step you have taken to reshape the vision and values of your organization to meet the twin challenges of the fourth industrial revolution and globalization 4.0? With that, okay. over to you. Thank I'm you. I'm glad you got the longer question. <laughs> so, um, can you hear me? Yes. So the first question about a formative experience that has helped me become a leader, I think, it's difficult to pinpoint one specific incident. I think it's a, it's a chain of experiences that really helped develop you and build you up. But maybe if I were to pick one of them, I would say it was when I was first appointed the CEO of Masdar. Masdar is a renewable energy company based out of Abu Dhabi. And it's not because it's my first leadership role, but also because the company was very global. So 80% of the assets were global. Um, we operate different solar and wind power plants from the UK to Spain to areas like Afghanistan and Seychelles. So it really expanded my leadership skills when it comes to managing a company that competes globally. The other aspect was, it was a time where renewable energy was really transforming from being a heavily subsidized technology to becoming one that's commercially viable. So we actually witnessed the prices of solar and wind drop dramatically. And to become a leader uh, in that field, you really have to go out of your way to think of unconventional ways. So as an example, when it was subsidized, when it was still a luxury, we were just a developer and we would contract a you know, construction company to do the work. As it became more commercially viable, the margins became very thin and we had to be very competitive. So we had to roll up our sleeves and actually go into the supply chain and actually negotiate with the contractor, the subcontractor, and so forth. So that really helped me evolve from leading a traditional business that was you know, working comfortably, I should say, to one that's being shifting quickly to bid into highly competitive sector. Um, we managed to achieve the lowest price for solar globally in a bid uh, in Dubai. Uh, we managed to compete globally as well. So I think that to me was a big shift it's a great experience of managing an international company uh, where you have to go beyond your traditional way. Um, besides going down the supply chain and finding a solution to really lead as a company globally, what we did was, because the sector was evolving so fast and because we wanted to be ahead of the game, we actually had an institute called Master Institute in collaboration with MIT. So when we bid, we didn't bid on technologies available today. We had become more creative by looking into the emerging ones and bid on some that's still not even ready in the market. So leadership is not only about being able to squeeze a supply chain, but it's also about um, being, having an appetite for risk, but in a controlled manner. So that small change of 
bidding on projects with technology that is still not 100% available. So we'd use the current one available for phase one, but for phase two, we'd actually put a price that is not available today, but we know with as far. So it really pushes the team on the R&D side, the team on the um, construction side to squeeze uh, every uh, penny. And lastly, I think it was also managing a group of highly international people. Uh, we had um, different nationalities from different countries, um, and that actually helped us um, get into different markets. We had people speaking at least 12 languages in the country and the, and the company. So again, to me, that experience in a nutshell really developed me. I think throughout my experience, I've managed to develop leadership schools, even from university as you develop, but then that specific experience really stretched me a lot. And after that, I was appointed minister. So uh, I think it helped me be much more prepared for this role. Good. Good, uh, good morning to everybody. And uh, thank you for having this interest to be among with you and among with us. Mm -hmm. um, what have been the concrete steps I took regarding leadership and future leadership? The first thing is that my wife and I got four children. And I can tell you, this is a type of interesting leadership. Mm. And I remember an interview in 2002 when people were asking me, okay, leadership and so on. Now, what is your glory, your moment of, your glorious moment? And I said in 2002, 17 years ago, it's when I'm able to learn something to my children. Interesting. Because I think that uh, children and you now the millennials, the new generation, they are so bright, so intelligent, so global, that it is quite difficult as parent, but also as leader, to learn something, to add value to them. So this was my, and this is still my laborator, my, my lab, because when I see how this young generation is acting, developing, and so on, I learn a lot. Now, this was private. Now, professionally, uh, we are doing three things in the company. Uh, the first things, we, we call this uh, the leadership contract. And so we have established a kind of document, contract, in which we have 10 rules. And we have 34,000 people in 34,000 colleagues in, uh, in 60 countries. And this one pager represents the way we want to lead. Mm -hmm. And especially towards our customers, towards our own employees, our own staff. And this has been a kind of guidance, myself and my team, we're willing to provide to everybody. That's the mm -hmm. way, okay. That's the way, the way we see leadership. Now, it's good to have the document, but you need to assess the way you lead. And for us, we have chosen the so-called great place to work. And great, great place to work, uh, which, is, which has been developed by a, a foundation in, in Denmark, is assessing and giving you results how good or how bad your business environment in your company is. And since, since more than 10 years, we are assessing all our countries in an independent way to see how, f how they feel in our company, not only how they feel, but also we benchmark our results with many companies. If I take, for example, the global uh, results, there are 7,500 multinational assessing according to the same methodology mm -hmm. how people in these companies are feeling. And 10 years long, we have been working on this uh, to make sure that people are feeling good in our company, but also because nowadays it's, there is a war of talent. Mm -hmm. And if you want to attract the, the young generation, you need to become attractive as an employer. You have to demonstrate a modern leadership. And I'm quite proud to say that due to the work of everybody, we are today the number two worldwide great place to work. And for Europe, we are number five. Mm -hmm. This is the, se the, the second and the second real action we have taken regarding leadership. And the last but not least, um, indirectly, we have created uh, 
a CO for one month action. What is CO for one month? It's also regarding, well, it, it is providing the young generation professional experience. Mm -hmm. And it allows, in 47 countries today, it allows youngsters to shadow or local CEO for one month, or, or local CEO, and they will do that for one month. Now, if it is interesting for the youngsters, it is very interesting for us, because these 47 youngsters will spend one month with a local leader, but for sure they will also reflect in the way we are leading the company. So mm. what we expect from them is also to feed us about how they see we are leading the company, what can, we, what can we change? And one of the 47 will shadow me for one month. And I must say, for me, it's a very refreshing one month. Every year in October, I have one youngster spending really nights and days with me traveling the, around the world, participating to all kinds of, of meeting. But after each meeting, I'm, I'm asking, OK, how do you reflect about the way we are, say, uh, we are doing things, we are leading and so on? And it is always, uh, for me, a, a kind of learning expedition during one month uh, with, with this youngster. Interesting. Um, <clears throat> you want me so to I start guess with the question? Um, uh, yeah. you, can do, you can go ahead. It was very <clears throat> interesting the way you were describing uh, what has shaped your, your first experience. But if I understand well, you were in the, in the business community, Correct, yes. and now you have moved on in, I would say, the political uh, community, uh, political leadership. And, and my first question is, OK, what is the difference between business leadership mm -hmm. and, and the 4.0, and, and especially political leadership? And how do you see your role as Minister of Education, um, what is your, then your, your appetite for risk? You were discussing about your appetite for risk as a, as a business leader, but what is your appetite for risk a, a, as a minister? So could you elaborate on Absolutely. this? Absolutely. I think that's a great question. <clears throat> if I were to compare, as you mentioned, um, leadership and the commercial side, I think everybody knows what it takes. Uh, you have a PNL, you have to be profitable, you have to grow, you have to acquire the right talents. So providing leadership was measurable tangible. Uh, we uh, hit our results two years ahead of time. We were able to break the lowest uh, prices in solar globally. And we expanded quite big. I think we almost increased our asset base by 60% in three years. So achieving these clear goals was easy. Uh, even when it comes to employee satisfaction, we had a big retention. Uh, we intentionally underpaid compared to our competitors because we wanted those that join us to come in for the mission, not for the monetary value, so it was very measurable. When you come to government, and I have to quote myself, before coming to government, I knew colleagues of mine who were down, uh, in government that were saying, you know what, they have it easy. They don't have a PNL to hit. I have targets quarterly, so I wish I was in their place. Now I regret that. Um, for two reasons, I think government is, it's difficult to, to measure your impact, especially when you're so used to monitoring yourself and readjusting. Um, uh, and, 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 and if you're a public listed company, you have a price that you can measure on a daily basis. But with government, how do you define success? And specifically when it comes to education, uh, it's one of the hardest reform you can do because the outcome takes a long time. If you do tax reform or any kind of reform, you can actually see the impact almost immediately, immigration reform. But educational reform takes a very long time. And secondly, it's a very personal topic because you're touching the most precious thing that people really value. And one thing I've noticed is that people are very opinionated when it comes to education. Everybody has an opinion on what needs to, how things should be taught. So that was a big shift for me uh, to move into government. Uh, but then we started working on, I applied the commercial mindset to it. And if we think through, um, to elaborate on this, what will be different <clears throat> in your country uh, regarding the Minister of uh, Higher Education or for Education, in 10 or 15 years from now, what will be different between you today and, mm. and this person in 10 or 15 years from now? So I'll tell you what, 
<clears throat> maybe I can just give the audience a context. Uh, the UAE is a very young country. We were formed in 1971. Uh, we were latecomers to education, not even globally, even within the region. Uh, we were one of the latest countries to have formal education. In fact, when the Federation was formed, we were getting teachers from neighboring countries like Jordan, Syria, and Egypt. So we're very late. And now with the economy, you're trying to leapfrog from a fairly illiterate community. When the Federation was formed, only half the community was liter basic literacy. And now you're talking about you know, advanced science, about technology, about architect as well. So how can you, as a minister of higher education, ensure that you have the right talent supply to feed into this economy? One of my biggest challenges is ensure, how can I improve the quality of higher education when I depend on schools, I depend on K-12. So I can't really improve a lot until they are ready. So well, that was one of the reasons why when I was appointed, the two ministries which were separate were actually combined. So now they're under one umbrella. Okay. Um, and that actually made it easier to work together. Um, historically, the UAE, if you go to university, because the education system was a bit weak and, and very young, students, when they graduated, they were still lacking some areas. So we had a foundational year. Um, and the government was saying, why do you have a foundational year? You have to remove this. So higher education was blaming K-12, saying you guys are graduating weak students. But they were blaming us, saying you're graduating bad teachers. It was back and forth. So with the merger, we're solving it now. The numbers are, are getting much less. But let me go back to one of your questions, which is the appetite for risk in government. I think I'm lucky enough to be where I am because we have a big appetite for risk. Um, we have the first minister for artificial intelligence. We have a government accelerators, which is basically taking the concept of business accelerators into government. You take, uh, let's say, a big issue, you define a subset, and within 100 days, you have to deliver. So the appetite for risk in the government is actually higher. We're actually adopting technologies like drones, um, driverless cars. In terms of regulation, the government is relaxing some laws to allow for these technologies to thrive. So my appetite is higher, uh, given what we can do with the current regulatory framework. But now let me ask you a question. Yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> you talked about a leadership contract, and you mentioned that it's a simple one-pager. It's the way that we define leadership, and I think they have to sign up for it. When you say we defined it, who defines it? Is it the company? Is it, is it a collective effort? And if so, do you keep redefining it with the constant change and evolution of leadership? Um, indeed, uh, a, a good question. This uh, one pager has been defined um, based on, on the work I have done uh, with the senior leadership. Mm -hmm. So mainly, um, let's say, the top 15 people of the mm -hmm. companies, mm -hmm. but then also embedding the, the next two to 250 to 300 leaders. Mm -hmm. But this is also leadership. At mm -hmm. the end of the day, somebody has to be responsible and I'm the one responsible. So uh, you discuss, but then you come to a document, and I can tell you, it, it was really, like in the politics, <laughs> every word has been discussed, mm -hmm. uh, because it should last long. Absolutely. So w when you define your, your leadership, it's not for the next 12 months. It should be uh, for several years um, that, that you define this. And, and your leadership should also embrace the future should anticipate uh, the future. And that's what we have tried to do. Sure. Do you have a question for me? Should I ask yeah. you one more? Yeah, sure. <clears throat> I found it very fascinating what you've done with the young people joining, yeah. the shadowing part. And to be honest, I was considering that. But my question to you is, is it a burden? Because you have to no. have someone with you sometimes. Would you want to screen what you're saying? Um, does it add to your? administrative things where you need to make sure that that person's on time and, and is it more of a burden or is it an opportunity for it, do you think? If it's not imposed, would you still go with it or not? No, I, I must say I'm extremely impressed mm -hmm. by, by the young generation. Mm -hmm. uh, everybody <clears> is saying, yeah, millennials are difficult to manage and so on. I must say we are seeing, we are hiring wonderful people. Mm -hmm. For sure, this year we had 268,000 candidates. Wow. 268,000 candidates in 47 countries. 
And I can tell you, in every country, the last 10 are exceptional. Mm. Uh, and um, no, it's not a burden. It's really, uh, for me, it's a, it's a kind of uh, oxygen or mm. something different. Refreshing. Yeah, refreshing. Mm -hmm. uh, because I'm really I'm curious how they, they, they are experiencing what we are doing. Mm -hmm. And I'm also very impressed. Uh, and that's also, I think, the leadership of the future. I am impressed by, by their purpose. They, they are very purpose-driven. They mm -hmm. want to have positive impact uh, on the world. There is no, almost no single highly talented millionaire who is not saying, I want to have impact in the world, which is great. But I think leadership is also for us to give them the opportunity, the framework to have this impact in the world. Mm -hmm. And, uh, okay, especially with us, we are employment, work, it's, it's very, very mm -hmm. sensitive today. Mm -hmm. And I've seen many of them joining us and taking a project to have a positive impact on the world. Mm -hmm. Would you say that Millennials seeking impact had to some extent affected them negatively? I've heard this from many CEOs saying, we love Millennials, we attract them. The issue is they want to have a big impact today from day one. But in order to have impact, you have to go through, you know, a long iterative process of self-development of and do the boring stuff as well. And the, 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 the feedback I got was how they actually leave too soon because they can't see the impact. Yeah. How can you as a leader ensure yeah. that they stick on and they know that will be impactful? The, the, I think this is one of the challenge um, in this world and, and going forward because the young generation is not interested anymore to belong to a company. Mm -hmm. They want to belong and, and identify themselves to a, to a purpose, to a project. And so it means if, if what they are doing is not more aligned with their interest, their expectation, they are leaving. Mm -hmm. Now, for a company, but also for both of them, it, it's complex because you need also time. You need time to learn. You need time to, to get experience. And I think the challenge for us as a company is to, to keep them interested so that they can stay, and they, they can learn, and, and so that they become resilient because they have also to, to see that if they are always moving, they don't build capabilities they need to have impact in the world. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this process, as leader of companies, is, is quite a challenging one. Mm -hmm. How do you attract the right talent? How do you, you groom them? How do you develop them? Mm -hmm. Interesting. What about your view, then, as a, as a, as a leader of, of, of a country? Sure. How do you make sure that uh, the next generation will develop the country, will build a better world? Sure. Than, uh, than the previous one, because this is also one of our big challenges. To build a better world is Absolutely. not easy. Absolutely. And also working in, in government is not the most attractive option. If you have a very smart individual, they'd love to go either start their own company or join private sector. So attracting young talent, you have no choice but to inspire them. So even with my team, you can ask the team with me, they've joined me for the vision of what they're trying to achieve. And also trying to give them enough space to do what they want. So for example, they might have four out of five KPIs that they need to deliver on, but one is whatever they choose. Because if you don't give them the freedom to try and do something, come up with something that they actually like, even though it's not related, they actually can come back with very interesting um, ideas. So it's two elements. One is to always go back to the vision, to the goal, to inspire them. And secondly is also to give them room to do whatever they want. And I have, I have WhatsApp group with, with, with um, my employees and I always constantly send clips or videos or, or, or articles that talk about such impact to remind them what we're doing. Because today, even in government, we, look very, we work very late hours. We work over the weekend. So sometimes to avoid burnout, you have to also inspire people. So I think that's the best way to do it. Inspiration, number one. And two, enough freedom to do whatever they want with the amount of time that they have, 20% of the time. Great. No. 
Are we good on time? Leadership 4.0 is also interaction. It's communication and interaction. Perhaps we, we can take a question from the room. <laughs> eh? Are there questions in the room? Are those for I have to ask him again? Or for me? Uh, there is one question here. Hello, everyone. Thank you for those insights. It was very inspirational. Um, my name is Darina. I run a startup based in Switzerland. Uh, we do monitoring systems for horses, a bit different. Um, but my question will be, our investors are always asking me, what, what is keeping you up at night to figure out what is the number one pain factor and mm -hmm. to also focus on the Ooh. number one challenge? If I may ask you, what, what would be regarding leadership and, and leadership challenges, what would be the number one thing that you feel being your, your biggest challenge right now? Um, let me speak from experience. I think the, the most difficult thing with the leadership is not to acquire the skills required because these will be formed. I think the most difficult thing is to stay humble when you're a leader because it's very easy when you become a CEO or a minister to be consumed with the position and, and always to go back and continue learning. So I was lucky enough to be uh, moving between different sectors, renewable energy, um, investments and so forth. Um, the habit of constantly um, being in a self-learning mode always ha is helpful to become a leader. So A, staying humble, and two, continuous learning. You never graduate, I tell my employees. Getting a degree is the start of the journey, it's not the end. So these two, to me, are the most important ones for leadership. First of all, uh, it's official. I want to sleep seven hours per night. <laughs> <laughs> this is more than leadership. <laughs> and this is public in my company. So uh, everybody knows that. And I encourage everybody to sleep at least seven hours because it's, uh, it's important to be uh, healthy. And, and there have been scientific study mm -hmm. that uh, if you want to avoid Alzheimer and so on, you should sleep seven hours per night. So I said, don't expect from me if you send a, a presentation at 11 o'clock for a seven hours meeting and the next day that I read it. No. And everybody knows that. And uh, I think it's a good rule. I promote it because it's vital workforce. Second, um, fortunately, I sleep well. But yes, there are short-term risk and, and long-term risk, which could wake me at night. The, the mid-term things are all about people. A and as a business leader, you must make sure you have the right talent in, in your company. And nowadays, it's not easy. It's not easy. Uh, you are, a, uh, you are a startup or you are a big company, I think we face the same issue. How do you attract the right talent at the right moment and how do you groom them in the company? Because if you don't have the right talent, you block your expansion, you, block your, you, you don't realize your dream, your vision, and so on. So I think small or big, this is for me what is very important. People, talent, having enough talent in the company. Second, when, when you are in a business like ours, uh, we put at work every day two million people, every day. In, and something can happen, you know, and uh, it's called reputation risk. And one of these two million people can do a, a bad thing at all customers, and, and the next day we are uh, in all the newspapers, uh, and it can endanger uh, the company. And this is something when you rely on so many countries, so many people, your risk exposure is, is huge. And you must make sure that you have the best system in place, the education in place to prevent that kind of risk. But we are a human resources uh, business and human beings are sometimes unpredictable. Good. Any other question about Thank leadership? We have one minute left, either wrap up uh, or... Sadia has one, perhaps. Well, I think since we have about a minute left um, from the session, we will need to try to bring this to a close. I was told that I, I don't need to try to summarize everything on Leadership 4.0, but there were a couple of um, com comments that you brought up that were common to both of you. Um, curiosity and constant learning. Um, giving back to the next generation and ensuring that they have the frameworks that they need to lead. 
the importance of rest and balance in sleep, yes. um, and of course, purpose. It's fundamental to what both of you were talking about. Absolutely. Please join me in thanking Minister Falassi and Alain Dejas. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.